start this morning off with our call to worship. I'm going to be reading this morning from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And this is the word of the Lord. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Let's worship together. In tenderness he saw me Weary and sick with sin And on his shoulders brought me to his fold again while angels in his presence sang unto the courts of heaven rang oh the love that taught me oh the love that for me while I was sinning, needy and poor and blind. He whispered to assure me, I found thee thou.
Take these hands I know they're empty But with you I can Be used for beauty In your perfect plan All I am is yours And take these feet I know they stumble, but you use the weak. You use the humble, Lord, so please use me. All I am is yours. I give you all my life. I'm letting it go. A living sacrifice, no longer my own. All I am is yours. All I am is yours. And take this heart, set it on fire, shining in the dark. I want to tell the world of who you are. All I am is yours. And I give you all my life. I'm letting it go, a living sacrifice, no longer my own. All I am is yours, all I am is yours. I give you everything, to you I belong. Every beat of my heart, the breath in my lungs. All I am is yours, all I am is yours. my hands up God I surrender all that I am for your glory your honor your fame I lift my hands up God I surrender to you and I give you all my life I'm letting it go a living sacrifice no longer my own all I am is yours all I am is yours I give you everything to you I belong every beat of my heart the breath in my lungs all I am is yours all I am is yours Good morning, Temecula. Hey, we want to thank you guys for being here today, especially if you were um, with us last week and joining again this week. We're really happy you were here. Um, and if you've done that, let's turn around and say hello and maybe say I'm new or a second time so we can greet you. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get back to our seats. I'd love to see everyone fellowshipping, but we have some announcements to get to. All right, so coming up today after service, we have the Explore the Hills. If you are new and you have liked what you've heard, which I know you have, because <laughs> I love it, um, we encourage you to come out to the server or come out after church today where there will be food where you can learn about who we are, what our mission is, and then also connect with some of our elders and teaching pastors as well. It's a great opportunity for you guys to get connected and uh, learn who we are. So we encourage you to come and attend that, and then we'd love to see you. And then I'll be at 2.15 after church today. So, 
12.50. 12, that's when, yes, yes, 12.59. If you want food, be there at 12.50. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then this Saturday, speaking of food, is a night to remember. So it's this Saturday from 5 to 9. In previous years, this was a Valentine's Day dinner for couples to get to go to the Richardson's lovely house and to have a romantic evening. But this night to remember is a whole church invitation. We really want to see all people come, singles, couples, families to be able to come and participate so make sure you sign up ASAP if you want to have some of the delicious chicken cordon bleu or prime rib Yum. and there'll be entertainment and fun the flyer is in your bulletin you can sign up with the QR code and it's $26 per person now we don't want anyone to be left out of this amazing church event so if you have any um, qualms about the payment. You, we have scholarships available, so please talk to Dave. He'd be happy to help you out with that. And the purpose of this event is to raise money for our high school ministry, who is going to be serving all of us that night. It's to help them to with our upcoming Mexico trip we have. So for our questions, you can get in touch with Eric Richardson. Speaking of Mexico, so we have a parent meeting for our Mexico trip next week. That's going to be April 23rd from 2.15 to 12.45. We'd really encourage you guys to come out if you have questions about Mexico, um, any of the instability that may be happening there, if you have questions about money and cost. Uh, this is the time and opportunity for you guys to come and really uh, connect with uh, Nathaniel or Andrew uh, to really learn about it. Again, it's a great opportunity for these high schoolers to come out, and it's uh, anybody for 14 or older. So if it's just high schoolers or parents, we encourage you both to really come and learn about the opportunity. Again, this mission, mission trip will be in Tijuana, um, and it'll help build homes for the needy and learn about God's heart for the world. Uh, it's open to all families, like I said, and about 425 per person to join. So please come to this informational meeting next Sunday to learn everything you can about the Mexico trip. A verse I've been really encouraged by recently is in Ephesians 5, 18, and it says, but be, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for God. And so we have an invitation and opportunity for you to participate in corporate worship of all of us together. We'll have a night of worship on Friday, April 28th from 6.30 to 7.30. We invite all of you guys to be here, including your children. It's just so joyful to get to see them worshiping the Lord along with you. So it's located here at the church. All right, we have an announcement coming up for a picnic. We'll have Dave come up. And while he's coming up, if you are new, we do have welcome packets in the back. I forgot to mention that. So please get one of those welcome packets and learn more what we got for you. So a lot's going on in our church this month. Sorry, Brian. I was trying to use your, trying to use your, vo your voice for a second. But we're going to end this month with a church picnic. And we just want to make sure you guys all know that we want everyone to come out. We're not even going to have donuts that morning. So if you want a donut, then you have to get one beforehand. But are you going to come out? So how does bacon, avocado, cheeseburgers with all the fixings and hot dogs and veggie burgers sound? <laughs> right? Pretty good? All right? We got some people. Okay. Well, you're not on your head, so that means you have to come now. So uh, we're going to cook for you guys. So we are so grateful that we have the ability as a church to meet and do these events. And it is a huge park with slides and a basketball court, bring bikes, frisbees, baseballs, as long as it's farther enough away that it didn't hit me. But we want families to come with their kids, and there's a playground there, all those things. Bring some easy ups. We'll have some as well there. But we really want to just end this month. There's a lot going on this month, and I'm so thankful that we have a church that's so connected and can do all these events. But we'd like to end that, that month with a barbecue for all of you. So we hope that you can make that. If you're coming, would you please uh, sign up so we know how many burgers we need to get, or if there's some vegetarians, some veggie burgers, or if kids want hot dogs. We need to know that information um, if you don't sign up for food, you can come, but you'll be in the end of the line for the burgers. Right, John? So, all right. So please sign up. You plan on coming because we want a barbecue for you, and we're going to go all out and make sure everyone has a great burger or a hot dog or veggie burger. Cool? All right. We're, cool. All right, Nathaniel. Right. So, Nathaniel, I'm there. So we're going to continue our time now with an offering. If you're new with us this morning, again, we just want to make sure you know that this is just for our regular church attenders. We're just glad you're here this morning. There's some welcome packets uh, when you came in and when you can get one on the way out. Um, and also we have contact cards in here. And if there's ever a prayer request or a practical need that we can be praying for you, or if you have some questions from our church, um, you can put it on there. It can be anonymous if it needs to be, or we can, uh, you know, let the church pray. 
And speaking of that, we have two ladies this week that are going to be having surgeries. And one is Ruthie Van Hovel. She's been dealing with a bad back for a long time. And so hopefully we'll be praying that that surgery goes on Thursday, right, John? It's Thursday. So we'd be praying for that. She's going to have surgery, and she's going to be in that hospital for about five days. So we'll be praying for John and Ruthie. Um, it'd be a good, good break for Ruthie, I think. But <laughs> no, all seriousness. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> but yeah, no. Yeah, I did. I did. I, I'll meet with the elders afterwards. Um, but let's be praying for, for Ruthie and John as well. Um, and then also we have Michelle Neely, who's going to have some surgery this week. Um, and make sure that that surgery goes well. But there might be some other surgery that might, they might need to do because they found some things uh, while they were getting ready for the other surgery. So let's pray that that is not necessary, that the first surgery just goes well and that they don't have to do anything else. So let's be praying for those ladies and along with our church. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we're even able to come and speak to the Almighty God, the creator of the universe and every molecule and every atom and everything in between. You own all of it, you created all of it, and you hold it all in your hands, Lord. And what a privilege it is that we can come and actually speak to you and that you hear us. So we pray that we lift up these ladies of our church, Lord. We thank you for them, Lord, and we just pray for their families and for the doctors, for wisdom. And, Lord, we just pray that it's your will, Lord, that things go the way that we would want them. But, Lord, if they go a different way, Lord, we know that you are still in control, Lord, and that we will be there as your will is, Lord. Lord, we thank you again for this church and all these activities that are coming up, Lord. I just pray for all those that are involved, Lord, that um, clarity and patience and skill to get those things ready for our church, Lord. We thank you again for this this family, Lord, this church, your bride. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. stand with us. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. You are everything. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Be my everything. 
Christ in me, yeah. Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. You are everything. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Oh, be my everything. s 
Please remain standing for the reading of the word. If you want to join me in your Bibles, we're going to be um, at the end of Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 32, and going through chapter 12, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has, been given, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, Brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can stand in your presence today and hear the word proclaimed. I pray for Nathaniel as he comes up and, and leads us to see the things that you would have us to see. I pray that our eyes would, would see, our, our minds would be opened, our hearts would be receptive to be changed by you, Lord, through your spirit, by your word. And we give you all praise, Lord. We give you all glory. And we thank you. In your name, amen. Thank you, Brian and worship team. That was awesome. All week, I've been meaning to email the worship team and tell them, you guys should do songs about surrender this week, because that's what my message is, and I didn't, but God knew, so that's awesome. All right, well, on June 26, 2007, while on a training exercise off of the Oregon coast, Major Gregory D. Young of the Air National Guard flew his F-15A fighter into the Pacific Ocean. The $32 million aircraft was destroyed, and the pilot was killed. And there was no distress call. There was no attempt to eject. There was no apparent aircraft malfunction. Uh, Young was just 34 years old. He had 2,300 hours of flight time and more than 750 hours of that flight time in F-15s. And his colleagues, his friends, and his family were left wondering what caused this pilot to guide his airplane into the ocean at over 600 miles per hour. And after investigators sifted through the wreckage and the data, they concluded that Young had experienced spatial disorientation. Spatial disorientation is when you lose your sense of which way is up and which way is down. You lose your sense of where the horizon is. And you mistake what you're feeling for what is really happening. And the FAA estimates that spatial disorientation 
is responsible for about 15% of aviation accidents and about 25 to 30% of high performance aircraft accidents. Um, spatial disorientation is responsible for the crash that killed JFK Jr. and for the crash that killed Kobe Bryant. I heard one pilot who described how his co-pilot took off on a moonless night from a sparsely populated area, and after takeoff, they were in a 10-degree bank. And as they climbed a 400 feet, they were in a 30-degree bank. And the co-pilot that, remarked that the instruments seemed to be off. And at 600 feet, they were in a 60-degree bank. And he thought the instruments were all failing. And when they got past 90 degrees, which is flying completely sideways, the pilot took over and leveled the plane out. And when the plane leveled, the co-pilot fell to the side of the airplane because his brain was still telling him that he had been flying up the whole time. Another pilot described how he was flying on a moonless night and his plane was being refueled by a midair by a refueling tanker. And after a few moments, he recognized that he was completely disoriented because he was feeling that the wing of the refueling tanker was the actual horizon. And he, he recognized his disorientation immediately told the co-pilot, take over the plane now. <laughs> uh, another pilot was talking about how he was flying over water on a night with a full moon. And he became completely convinced that the reflection of the moon in the water was the actual moon itself and that he was flying upside down. So, and this is crazy, the average life expectancy of a pilot who is not trained to fly according to his instrumentation and then enters into clouds is 178 seconds. I had to double check that because I had a hard time believing that. But 178 seconds is how long they last if they're not trained to fly according to instrumentations and enter clouds. And so today, a major part of flight school is spatial disorientation training. And so it's a scary thought that we can become convinced that up is down and down is up. But I'm sharing that because the reality is that the Bible teaches that apart from Christ, we're all flying upside down, headed for utter disaster. And through the gospel, we're given the truth about which way is up and which way is down. We're given a new direction and new power to course correct, to level ourselves rightly. So Jesus gives us a fundamentally new orientation to life, but we have to trust God so that we can align ourselves as he would have us live. And today we arrive at a passage that shows us what our new orientation to life should be. How does God want us to live? What should our fundamental orientation in life be? How can we fly our, our lives rightly so we don't end in disaster? That's what we're looking at today. And we're picking up our study through the book of Romans today after we've paused for the past couple of weeks for Easter. And we come today to a major transition in the letter to the Romans. And since this section is so pivotal, we're covering just one single verse today, Romans 12.1. And what I'm going to do is unpack this verse in three steps. So we're going to see three points today as we go through this verse about our new orientation that we are to have in life. So open with me to Romans 12.1. If you're not already there, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And let's begin reading in verse 1. It says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So Paul begins with an appeal. He says, I appeal to you. That verb, it carries the sense of earnestness, in urgency and authority. It's this exhortation that comes with authority. It's as if Paul is writing this letter and he lifts his pen, he puts his arm around us and looks us in the eyes and he says, I urge you in view of God's mercies, God's great mercy to you. 
his many mercies, his continued mercies, I urge you. What stronger plea could he make? And what are we urged to do? He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The first point on your outline, the first thing we see today is this. Our new orientation to life is that we are to live for God in complete surrender. We are to live for God in complete surrender. That's the first point. What Paul says is that we are to be living sacrifices. And this would have been an especially powerful image for somebody who grew up in a culture, where, in a place where animal sacrifice was a regular thing they had seen. You see, whether or not they were Jews or Gentiles, they had seen animal sacrifice. They had seen it up close. And I want you to imagine the experience of the Jews. They had raised a lamb as a baby. They'd watched it be born, watched it find find its footing for the first time, watched it nurse from its mother. They'd raised it. They'd tended it. They'd fed it. They'd played with it. They'd even been annoyed by it. And now they stood by an altar and watched as this lamb was identified with their sin. And this lamb was held in place, and a knife was raised in a ritual manner. And as the knife came down, it it slit the animal's neck, and blood gushed out as life left the lamb's eyes. The lamb was emptied of life, emptied of will and desire, and then its body was laid on the altar and engulfed in flames. That's what sacrifice meant. And so when Paul says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This was a powerful, vivid picture of death and surrender. But what's amazing is that we are not to be dead sacrifices like the lamb was. We are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. God's not looking for a dead sacrifice, but for a sacrifice that lives for him each day. And notice that Paul specifies that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is a way of saying your whole person, all you are, all you have, but it also specifies that it's who we are in our concrete relationships with this world. Our bodies are how we interact with this world. And that's why Paul specifies them here. It's in our daily interactions of everyday life that we are to be a living sacrifice. It's how you treat your family members, your brother, your sister, your kids, your husband, your wife. It's how you treat your coworkers. It's how you treat friends. It's it's what you look at with your eyes. It's how you use your mouth, how you use your mind, your intelligence. It's in daily living that you're surrendered to God. That's the sacrifice that we're to offer to God. Not in a temple, but in our homes, at our jobs, in our schools, in our recreation, in our private time. And how are we to live each day? Look at verse 1 again. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Holy means you belong to God. You're set apart unto him. You live in a way that honors him. And acceptable means that you're living in a way that is pleasing to him, a way that he would like you to live. You see, our souls were meant, they were designed to live for God, to orient our lives around him. But because of sin, we've become bent inward. We're self-centered, we're selfish when we should be God-centered. But what this is saying is that now we are called to live for him as a living sacrifice in surrender to him. And the shocking image that Paul uses here is that your whole self is to be laid on the altar like a sacrifice in the temple. And so you have a new way to live, a new way to be human. You're not to live for yourself, but for God. So your desires, your thoughts, your priorities, 
all of them come under the authority of God. All of them are laid down at the feet of Jesus, entrusted to him, surrendered to him. The reality is, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you are not your own. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says this, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We are not our own. We are the Lord's. And so we should flee from lies. We shouldn't seek what's comfortable, what's going to please our flesh. We are not our own. Let's forget ourselves and all that we think is ours because we are not our own. Let's not seek to please ourselves, but to please God. We are not our own. When I was a kid, I wanted to go to summer camp, and I remember my mom gave me a check, and she signed uh, the check to pay for it, but I wasn't sure exactly how much the deposit was for camp or how much or who it was supposed to be made out to, so she didn't put a name or amount, an amount down. She gave me a blank check, and she told me, don't lose that. <laughs> you see, she trusted me, but if someone else got a hold of that check, then they could make the check out to themselves. They could put down any amount they wanted. They could drain her entire bank account in one swoop. And when my mom signed that check, she made an open-ended commitment that everything she had in her bank account was available to whoever's name was written at the top of that check. And that is what God is looking for from you and from me. So picture your whole life as a blank check. And what God wants you to do is to make it out to him, sign it, hand it over, and don't put any amount on it. You're a living sacrifice to him. That's your orientation to life now. But I want you to ask yourself, have you signed your life over to God? Imagine that you have that check and you're taking it to the throne room of God And you slide it under the door as an act of worship. You say, Lord, I commit to you all I am and all I have forever. That means you'll go where he wants you to go. You'll pursue what he wants you to pursue. You'll forsake what he wants you to forsake. You'll endure what he wants you to endure. You'll give up what he wants you to give up. But what often happens is we sign our lives over to God, but in the fine print, we make some exceptions. We say, you see, we're living sacrifices, but the problem with living sacrifices is they tend to crawl off the altar. We say, God, I trust you with it all, but not this area of my life and not that area of my life. God, I trust you with it all, but don't touch this. I trust you, but don't you dare ask me to give up that part of my life. I trust you as long as you don't take that away. There's these one or two areas that are off limits to your supervision, to your authority, to your control. And what that means is that we have idols in our lives. And so we need to continually live in glad surrender, dying to ourselves to live for God. And when we do that, we find real, true life. In Matthew chapter 16, it's Jesus said, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Abraham was someone who had lived for God. He had given God a blank check to his life. But then came the day when God decided to make a withdrawal based on that blank check. And for Abraham, it seems very possible that his son Isaac had become this this point of affection in his heart, in his life, that was heading towards destroying his relationship with God. And so God demanded that Abraham surrender the most precious thing in his life, not to take it away from him, but to make sure he was really holding the blank check to Abraham's life. And in the story, Abraham takes Isaac to the hill, the hill that would one day be the very temple of God. And there he raises his knife, and at the last moment, God provides a sacrifice 
so that Isaac is spared. And of course, that pointed all towards God the Father sacrificing his own son for our sake. But Abraham was tested to remove Isaac as an idol of his heart. And Jesus does the same thing to a rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. It says in Mark 10, verse 17, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. This guy says, I'm doing all the right stuff. But Jesus loved him, and so Jesus looked into his heart to see what idol had creeped into the place that belonged to God. And it says in, in Mark 10, 21, it says, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I love that little detail Mark gives us. He says, Jesus is going to say what he's going to say because he loves him. And what's he saying? He says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. See, Jesus will look at your life. He'll see the area of your life that you're not willing willing to yield to him and surrender. And he'll lay his finger on what's most precious in your life, and he'll say that. Give me that, and come follow me. And Jesus does this, not to hurt us, but because he loves us. And he knows that even good things in our lives can destroy us if they become idols. Idolatry is when something, even a good thing, becomes an ultimate thing. Something that our identity is based on. Something we look to for security, for well-being. And Jesus knows that idols cause us to fly upside down. And maybe even right now in your heart, God is revealing an area of idolatry that needs to be signed over to him, to his supervision. Maybe you're wrestling in your heart right now if you're willing to let go. Maybe you're wrestling with God if you will trust, whether you'll trust him. Can you really trust him with that area of your life? Can you really surrender that to him? Well, the next point we're going to see is the basis you have for knowing that you absolutely can trust him. And then the next point we're going to see is this. We ought to live for God in surrender because of God's mercies to us. Because of God's mercies to us. You see, this appeal, this new orientation to life is based on something. Look at verse 1 again. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And whenever you see your Bible and you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore, right? Okay, so therefore is a connecting word. It says what I'm about to say to you is based on something I've previously said. And what is it based on? It says, therefore, I I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, By the mercies of God. And here's what you need to understand. This point in the letter is the central pivot point in the argument of the letter to the Romans. And for the past 11 chapters, Paul has been unpacking the theology of the gospel. And he'll spend chapters 12 through 16 unpacking how to respond to the gospel. So this is the point where the letter transitions from theology to exhortation, from teaching to commands, from the indicative to the imperative, from what God has done to what we are to do in response, from gospel theology to gospel living. And what this means is that that therefore is based on the entire previous 11 chapters, 
And what has Paul been doing for the past 11 chapters? He's been unfolding the mercies of God. He's been unfolding the gospel in all its glory. And the gospel is precisely God's mercy to inexcusable and undeserving sinners in giving his son to die for them, in justifying them freely by faith, and in sending his life-giving spirit in making them his own children. So I want to review with you, as we're at this pivot point, specifically how Paul has been unfolding God's mercy to us throughout this letter. Romans 1 through 3, remember, we're all about how we need God's mercy. We lack righteousness, so we need mercy. In chapter 1, he exposes the depravity of man. He says that although all people have knowledge of the existence of God through nature, all act as if God does not exist. And even if they verbally acknowledge God, they actually worship the creation rather than the creator. And this moral disintegration in our lives shows that we are held in the power of sin. In Romans 1.21, Paul said, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. See, we're, we're bent inward. We're flying upside down. And in chapters 2 and 3, he shows that the Jews are no better off than Gentiles. In fact, they will be judged for their uncompassionate judgment of Gentiles. They may be religious, but the problem with the merely religious person is that religion can't actually change the heart. All are condemned rebels, churning away from God. None is righteous, not even one. But then in Romans 3.21 Jesus enters the scene, and he is the one who perfectly manifests God's mercy to undeserving rebel sinners like you and me. And Paul explains that because of Jesus, there's righteousness available to the unrighteous through faith. And this is the miracle of the gospel, that we can have righteousness that's not earned, but freely given, not achieved, but received by mercy alone. So Paul says in Romans 3.24 that we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And this truth is so glorious that Paul goes on to show that it's the consistent message of the whole Bible. In chapter 4, he shows that Abraham was righteous by faith alone, and David was righteous by faith alone. And that same righteousness through faith that they had is available to you and me. Chapter 5 shows us that we can have, because we have this righteousness through faith, we can be mercifully reconciled to God so that we have peace with God. And what the whole section from chapter 5 to 8 showed us is the certainty, the fullness, and the finality of what God has done through the merciful work of Jesus on the cross. Paul showed us that now we're in the sphere of God's grace. We are in Christ, not in Adam. And so we live under the mercy of God. And in chapter 6, Paul asked a rhetorical question. He said, if we're under God's mercy, under God's grace, does that mean I can just go on sinning? And his answer is that God's mercy not only saves us, but it gives us a whole new freedom in Christ. His mercy has made us a whole new person. So how could we go on sinning? And in chapter 7, he brings up another issue. If we're saved by the mercy of God, then what was the purpose of the Mosaic law? And Paul answers that the law may reveal sin, but it does not defeat sin. But in chapter 8, he says that Jesus did defeat sin. And so living under the old covenant, um, instead of living under the old covenant, we get to live under the new covenant, and we've been set free from sin and death 
all through the merciful work of Jesus on the cross. And so because of that mercy, we're given God's spirit so we can actually live as God intends. And chapter 8 ends with this stark declaration of God's faithfulness through Jesus. It says, For I am convinced, I am sure, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that declaration of God's faithfulness raised another question. If God is so faithful, how has he abandoned his covenant people, the Jewish people, who are largely rejecting Messiah Jesus? And that's the topic of Romans 9 through 11 that we've just finished studying. And Paul answers that question in Romans 9 by showing that since God is sovereign, he always bestows his mercy freely. So Romans 9.16 says it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Then Paul says that the Gentiles are being saved through faith, but Israel is failing to be saved because they're pursuing righteousness through the law and exercise he's just shown to be futile. And they can't earn it because God gives righteousness as a gift of mercy through faith alone. And then in chapter 11, Paul shows that God has saved some of Israel, a remnant, who have put their faith in Messiah Jesus. And he says that one day God will end Israel's present hardening and bring all Israel to faith in their Messiah and the Lord Jesus. And so all Israel will be saved. And so God's mercy in the gospel not only plays itself out in our individual lives, but it also plays itself out in his plan for the nations. And in Romans eleven thirty two, 32, it says, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. And then chapter 11 ends with a burst of praise towards God for his wisdom and knowledge. And it's at that point that Paul says, you have a new way to live, a new orientation to life. So Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. See, we have this new orientation to life. And the entire rest of the book of Romans is unpacking and spelling out what that new orientation looks like in our different relationships, in our different spheres of life. And all of this is through God's mercy, a response to God's mercy shown to us through Jesus. And this is hugely important because if you think that you are just supposed to live for God without basing this on what God has done for us, then, then that ends up being Pharisaic works righteousness. That means you're obeying in order to achieve right standing with God. But the gospel has shown us that right standing with God has been bought for us on the cross as a free gift of God's mercy. And now in response to that free gift, we are to live in glad surrender to Jesus. You know, the word mercy, it means a display of concern over somebody else's misfortune, or it means pity. It means compassion. And notice that mercies is plural here. It refers to the many and varied mercies that God has shown us. God shows us mercy upon mercy. Time after time, he has shown us mercy in our lives through the gospel of his son. And the ultimate display of his mercy was on the cross. So maybe you're here today, and God's confronting you with the need to surrender to him, to give him the blank check to your life. But you're scared if you're being honest. You need the theology of Romans 1 through 11. Because sometimes we have a warped view of God, and it can make us think that if we surrender to God, then God's going to make our lives horrible, and he's going to hurt us, and he's going to take all the things that are the best things in our lives away from us. And somehow we get the idea that God is stingy and unkind and he's looking to punish us for all the ways that our lives fail to measure up. But the gospel corrects this. In Romans 5.8, it says, But God shows us 
his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel says in Romans 8, 31, 32, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If he gave us his son, that he's going to give us everything that would be good for us. He cares for you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he loves you personally and individually. And so we can trust him and surrender our lives to him. So our motivation to live in surrender, it's never to earn anything. It's not to gain brownie points in heaven or stars on the giant refrigerator in the sky. It's It's a response to his mercy. It's grasping that our sins have been removed and we are forgiven and loved and adopted and filled with the Spirit and heaven-bound forever and ever. And that is what motivates us to say thank you to God the way that God requires. Saying thank you to God's grace and mercy is saying, I believe that you are so loving, so good, and I will give you whatever you ask for. And that's me. All of me, holding nothing back. And as this verse ends, it ends by telling us what God ultimately wants from us. And so our final point this morning is this. A life lived for God in surrender is the true and logical way to worship God. Romans 12, 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, this final phrase is the most uh, debated and difficult part of this verse to interpret. Um, You might notice in your Bibles, might translate it a little bit differently. In the footnote in the ESV, it says, or rational service. So there's two words here, and the word for worship is or service is pretty straightforward, and it's, it's used to describe animal sacrifices and other forms of worship in the temple. So it's continuing that living sacrifice picture. But the adjective that's translated spiritual or rational, that's more difficult. It's the Greek word logikos. And it's where we get the word logical from. And it has two senses. It can mean logical, sensible, reasonable, that which makes sense. Or it can have the sense of something that's mental. And so it's the sense of inner worship as instead of external worship of animal sacrifice. And so the basic point of this phrase is that this is the type of worship that makes sense if you understand the mercy God has shown you. This is the proper response to God's mercy. This is the kind of worship that God wants from us. And why? So why is it so important that I surrender to God? Because that's how you give him the worship that he wants. What God wants from you is not your church attendance, It's not your money, your rule-keeping, your morality, or your religious activities. It's you. He wants all of you. He wants you to be all in. He wants a relationship with you. He wants your heart. He wants to love you and be loved by you. And, And one implication of this is that halfway commitment is irrational. It makes no sense. Clear thinking means that the only logical response is to make our entire lives a sacrificial offering to God. Once you have a good view of God's mercy, then anything less than a total, complete sacrifice of yourself to God is irrational. It's flying sideways. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, we find Israel abandoning God. And the way that's expressed is in half-hearted devotion. In Malachi 1.6, it says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. 
If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Malachi says, even an earthly son shows honor to his father. And an earthly employee shows honor to his boss. But God says, where is my honor? And in verse 8 it says, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? What's happening here is they were going to pick an animal for sacrifice, and they looked at their huge flock, and they saw the blind, gimpy goat with one leg in the corner. And that's the one they picked to sacrifice as a gift to God. They were giving God their leftovers. They're giving God sacrifices that really cost them nothing. They were half-hearted in their devotion to God. And God says, if you presented that to a governor, would he accept that from your hand? And the implication is, should I accept that from your hand? And in verse 10 of Malachi 1, it says, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. In verse 14, cursed, is the, the, cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. God says, I'd rather you just shut the doors and not offer anything at all. And why? Because I am a great king. I am worthy. See, when Romans 12.1 says, this is your reasonable act of worship, it's teaching us that full surrender is true worship. It's the logical way to respond to God. That's how we give God the worship that he wants. And it also reminds us that half-hearted devotion just does not make sense. Total commitment is the only rational course to, say, to take when you see who God truly is. Nothing else makes sense. If you give your, yourself partially or half-heartedly, you're not thinking straight. You're not looking at what Jesus has done. A pastor named Sam Shoemaker put it this way. He said, To be a Christian means to give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus as I know. I remember as a young man, when I first came to grips with the reality of the gospel of Jesus. I was about 16 years old, and it dawned on me that if I really believed that this was true, then I had to live my whole life surrendered to Jesus. I had to be all in. If I believed that Jesus had risen from the dead and saved me from eternal hell, from God's wrath and judgment, then it made no sense for me to keep living for myself, to live in half-hearted, partial surrender. And so the only option left was full, complete surrender. And can I tell you that there is no better way to live? You see, in giving yourself up, you find that that's how you were created to live. You find, for the first time, the horizon is level. When you give yourself to Jesus, you find true life. Matthew, or Mark 8.35 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Let me encourage you. Lose your life and surrender to Jesus. And when you do, watch as he fills your life with purpose that's bigger and more important than yourself. Watch as he forgives you and begins to change you from the inside out. Watch as he frees you from the tyranny of idols, from the tyranny of lies, Watch as he gives you real joy in knowing him. Watch as he frees you from pretense, from having to prove yourself, from living for the expectations of others, 
for living for things that do not matter. Watch as he saves you, redeems you, and does things through you that you could never have imagined. G.K. Chesterton said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found and not tried. See, nobody who ever truly surrenders to Jesus is let down. And so we have a new orientation in life, and that's to live for God in complete surrender. And we ought to live for God in surrender because of God's mercies to us, and a life lived in surrender to God is the true and logical way to worship God. So let me encourage you. Don't continue flying upside down. Live for Jesus, surrender to him, and make him the centerpiece of your life. You will not be sorry. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we admit before you, Lord, that so often we lose our bearing. We lose our sense of what we should be doing and how we should be living. And, and Lord, even today, there's things that we have allowed to creep into the place in our heart that belongs only to you. And so, Lord, this morning, we want to surrender to you fully and completely. We want to give you the blank check to our lives once again. We want to tell you that we belong to you, and we want to live each day in glad surrender to you. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to make you the centerpiece of our lives. Lord, help us to live for you unreservedly. And I pray, Lord, that you'd be honored in our church and in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Nathaniel. We're going to close in one last song. Let's all stand together. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you.
Amen. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you guys uh, leading us in worship this morning. If you are a guest with us, or if you are new to our church, or even if you've been around for a while, um, we'd love for you to join us at 1215, in about 20 minutes here, for a, a meal for our Explore the Hills time. If you'd like just to get to know our church a little bit more, hear from our leadership, and hear what we're about as a church, it'll be right here, and there'll be, I think, Cane's Chicken, which is delicious, so feel free to stay for that. There's donuts and coffee outside, and if you need prayer today, you can fill out a card and drop it in the box at the back, or there's a prayer team that would love to pray with you this morning that'll be meeting right over here. So please join them if you need prayer this morning. Have a great Sunday. You're dismissed.